So much of chapter 8 and 9 are, are recording the miracles of Christ. Now, the, there's a pattern to Matthew, isn't there? Talking about the, the birth and the baptism and temptation up to the Sermon on the Mount. And you know how when Christ would send his apostles out to preach and confirm the word with signs following. Now, we have the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Now we have signs following. Now notice this. The reason we have these miracles recorded is so that we would have reason to believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's what Matthew is doing. Matthew believes Jesus is the Christ. He's writing the book of Matthew so that others that would come later that's us, okay? So that people like us that would come later would be able to see why he believed Jesus was the Christ. And seeing the reasons he believed, why then that would be why we would believe. Whenever you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, remember, that's why they're writing. There's many, 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 many lessons we can gather from these. But the main point of those four books is so that we would believe, who, know who Jesus is, know that he is the Christ, that promised Messiah from the Old Testament. And, and it's kind of like this. You ever been with a group and, and they've seen something and, and they want to tell you about it? And, well, just like someone says, man, I saw that car pass this building. Well, that, that's a little bit. Someone else said, I was there. I saw that red car too. It was racing down the highway. And you've, you've learned a little different. And someone says, yeah, I saw that red car and heard its wheels squealing. And then, and then John comes along and says, yeah, you know what else I saw? A little further down the road, cops got him. And, and so Matthew, and by the way, you start hearing more than one witness tell that. It's convincing, isn't it? And that's what happens. We're not going to be able to look at what Mark and Luke and John say about these things. But Matthew's starting to tell the story. And then Mark's going to show up. And, and Luke's going to tell his part. And John will, and these stories, when you start looking at them together and in their totality, they're convincing. And all these miracles, I want you to watch for this too. All the criticisms people throw at those miracles. Well, you could say that about anybody. They'd say, you, you know, you could just make up these things and tell that. Not the way these men told these miracles. The details confirm the miracles. And he did them in all different kinds, in all different situations. Some of them with, with great multitudes witnessing. Sometimes it was, uh, it, it was just a few in the company, very close. Sometimes it's, uh, it's with people he'd never met before, strangers. And sometimes it's those with whom he'd had intimate contact with. Uh, Jesus covers the basis so that no one miracle covers everything, but miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. You start looking at the variety of them and how they're told, and the evidence lies in the details. Now watch that as we get into this study. Okay, I'm gonna start with the memory work and just watch for these verses as we go. Here's your four memory verses. Matthew 8 and verse 20. And Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of the man hath not place to lay his head. What's the, what am I gonna leave blank in that? Think, think about that. Okay, Matthew 8, 27. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Matthew 9, in verse 2. And behold, they brought unto a man sick of palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Matthew 9 and verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. 
Let's see how much of this we can cover. Beginning in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Oh, there's so, so much going on here. First, I want you to know the multitudes were following him. All right, now some of these miracles are done, obviously, in, in private company and, and just a few things. But I want you to know there were multitudes of witnesses to some of these things, and remember that. Now this man came with leprosy. That's a skin disease, a dreaded disease, where you lose the feelings in your skin. And as a result, when you get infected, you don't realize it. And, and you don't feel like you need to treat it, and you don't know to treat it until, well, fingers and and appendages, they can start just falling off and rotting. And if you had leprosy, you couldn't go town. I mean, you had to stay away from people. If you came, you would hold something according to the law. Now, according to the old law, put something over your face so you wouldn't breathe on people. And as they would walk, you'd say, unclean, unclean. And no one is to touch a leper. And so this man with this incurable disease says, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. What faith that leper must have had. And Jesus, he touched him. So you didn't want to touch a leper. If anybody else had touched a leper, they would have leprosy. When Jesus touches a leper, the leper is cleansed. You see what happened there? And, and it wasn't that he touched him and he told him, okay, now go home and bring plenty of liquids and, and take this. I'll go get your prescription filled and, take, and three times a and in about a week you ought to start feeling. No, it wasn't, wasn't that. Immediately, immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. This was not a natural healing. This is supernatural. And, and not only that, if you had leprosy, here's, here's what the old law said. Go show the priest. The priest will look at you and see the priest, they were trained to do this. They look at you and look at that and, and they would determine, yep, yeah, that's leprosy. So you're a leper and now you, you stay away from people. And if you ever get healed, now if you think it ever goes, go back to the priest. They'd look it over and and they were the ones to say, okay, you're all right now. And you know, no one with leprosy had ever gone to the priest to be able to show that they'd been healed. Until now. And, and now this leprosy, leprosy, he goes to the priest. And the priest, well, yeah, I said he had leprosy. There's nothing wrong with this man now. It would serve as confirmation, see, that the miracle had occurred. You just think about someone that has cancer, and you can't see it. You can't, it shows up on the x-ray. Someone come along and touch them and says, okay, you're healed. You don't have to worry about your cancer. Just go to the doctor and tell him to x-ray you. And so he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, no, we don't need it. We got those x-rays. We, we know what it is. No, x-ray me, x-ray me. And you take the x-ray, and the doctor looks. There's nothing wrong. You are healed. And that would serve as confirmation, see? The doctor himself says, yeah, that, something happened here. And so all that goes into this miracle. You see how the details confirm the miracle, the way Matthew tells it, and what all he includes this, this isn't the way things are done by these folks that pretend that they can do miracles. These are real miracles. Or as Caden kept saying this more and more, that was more than a miracle. Now, I don't know what he meant by that, but he's talking about, look, that didn't just happen, did it? That was, that was a special event. Let's look at the next one. Look at the next one. Look what happens. Jesus, when he was entered into Capernaum, 
there came into him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servants do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed the self same hour. You know who a centurion is? I think of that word century. See, this is, this is a hundred. A centurion is a man in the army that has a hundred soldiers unto him. Now, centurions know about giving orders, don't they? I mean, if you've ever been in the army, didn't the sergeant know something about giving orders? I bet he did. He knew something about getting orders, too. And that's the way the centurion was. He knew what it was to have authority. You give order. You tell a man, all right, you go. And, you, and he's going to go. You come. And this one comes. He, he gives order. You go do this. It's going to be done. That's the kind of authority a centurion has. He said, not only that, I receive orders. I know what it is to get orders, and, and I follow orders when I do that. Centurions going around giving orders. You know, a lot of people give orders. I've known people come out of the army and they think they can order us around. <laughs> you know, they just, it just kind of comes natural to start giving orders like that. But this centurion, this man that goes around ordering people around, when he comes to Jesus, he doesn't order Jesus around. He beseeches him. He knows, look, I can't tell Jesus what to do, but I can ask him, my servant, is at home sick of the palsy. And then this is what hurts. He's grievously tormented. Oh, we've got all kinds of things, don't we, when we are sick to help relieve our symptoms. But just think if you had none of these things at the drugstore or anything to help you, you just suffer. The palsy is something that affects someone's motions. And, and so here his servant is laying in bed and he hurts and he can't do anything to relieve him. Grievously tormented. And this centurion, he can't, he can't deal with this one. This is not subject to his authority. So he goes to Jesus. And Jesus says, well, I'll come heal him. And he said, no, no, no. I'm not worthy that you come under my house. See, Jews weren't supposed to go to the house of a Gentile. And this is a Roman soldier. He said, look, I know about authority. I know how to give orders. And I know what you can do. Just give the word. And Jesus marveled. I, now that right there. I, I just don't want to skip that. When I see the works of God, I marvel. I saw the sun setting a few minutes ago, and I, I saw the clouds on the hills, and, and I see the finger of God in this, and I marvel at what God does. And I don't usually think much that God would marvel at man. Now, I bet sometimes God is thinking, oh, my, what are they doing now? How can they be so foolish to, and marvel that way? But also, here's God marveling because of great faith. Did you ever think that, that when you exercise great faith, <laughs> that God would watch you and marvel at you? Jesus marveled. He said, there's going to be people coming from the east and the west. See, that's people far away from Israel. They'll be come, they're going to sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, now the kingdom of heaven is often talking about the Lord's church, but here he's obviously talking about the eternal kingdom. When we're in heaven, we're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You ever thought you could do that? I, I'm just going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and 
What would you want to ask them? I said, I want Abraham to tell me. I said, Abraham, tell me how that was that night when God said, thy seed shall be as the stars of heaven. And old Abraham, he says, oh yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that story. And he starts telling how that was. And you think that's how it's going to be? Well, maybe, but it may be like this. Maybe Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are going to look at you. He says, I want you to tell me what it was like to live in those days when you knew that you were a Christian. And, and you, you knew how this story came out and, and what it was to, to know that I have the forgiveness of my sins. See, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't know what we know. And, and they struggled as, as they lived to try to, to, they longed to see these things. What a privilege, we get to see them. They may want to hear our story first. Well, we'll sit down with the, the children of the kingdom. That's the Israelites that ought to know these things. No, you're out of here because they don't believe. But like that centurion, those that believe, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. And Jesus says, I will. As thou hast believed, so be it unto thee. Now, he didn't say the servant is healed, but he knew what the centurion believed. And just what you believe, let that be. And so this, this man... It wasn't the man sick of palsy that had the faith. It was the centurion that had the faith, wasn't it? And he was healed that same hour. Again, there wasn't any delay. When that centurion got home and found out when his servant was healed, well, it was right. That's the same time Jesus said that. And so there's the evidence, see, that the Jesus is the Christ. Look at this next one. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and he healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. Now he's coming into Peter's house. This is that intimate company. He knows these people and they know him. This isn't stranger like the centurion showing up. And it's Peter's mother-in-law. Now stop right there just a minute. Peter had a mother-in-law. Now, I know what that means. Because <laughs> I know how you get mothers-in-laws, see? You marry their daughter and you get a mother-in-law. She comes with it, all right? And the only way to get a mother-in-law is to marry someone who has a mother, and then you get their mother-in-law. Don't think you just marry the person in the rest. No, the whole family comes with it, see? I mean, that's just part of it. So that's what happened. Now, Peter was later an elder of the church, remember? And to be an elder, you're to be the husband of one wife, aren't you? Okay. And not only that, Paul, he wasn't married, but he said, I have a right to lead about a wife like Peter. Peter had a wife. And the reason that's important is because there are people that think that Peter was a pope. But those same people think that a pope's not supposed to be married. And here Peter's got this mother-in-law. Now something's going on here, okay? okay? He was married and he never said he was a pope. So Peter had a mother-in-law. Now he goes in there and his mother-in-law is laying down and she's got a fever. Now we have fevers and fever may not seem so bad to us. I mean, you don't like that and all, but I tell you back then fevers, when you had a fever, you could be fixing to die of what you have. They didn't have a lot of things to treat things like that, like we do. And here she is. Now I can just imagine, don't you imagine Peter is probably in trouble now? I mean, his wife, Peter, what do you mean bringing all your friends over here to this house while my mother's sick with a fever? You know, just, and so here they are in her house and, he, and shows up in Peter's house and his mother-in-law's sick with a fever and Jesus touches her and look, it's not just that the fever left her. She got up and started tending to him. You know, I bet she started fixing them something to eat and, and checking on them and everything and making them comfortable in her house. 
that this is a miracle that take place. And among those that would know that this was a miracle that would take place. Intimate company, see? And then they started bringing all these people. Mentions the, those possessed with demons. Boy, that's something we don't know a lot about. It, and it tells us a lot about demons, but still we don't know a lot about them. And that's kind of makes them frightening, doesn't it? But whatever they are, Jesus could cast the demons out. And so that shows his power not only in this world, but in that world. And he was able to heal all that were coming to him. And in doing so, he fulfilled prophecy. You see how the details confirm the miracles? Look, let's go on to the next one. Now Jesus saw a great multitude about him. And he gave commandment to depart to the other side. A certain scribe said unto him, Master, I'll follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not place to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first, go bear my father. Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bear the dead. Now this isn't a miracle, but I want you to notice what this tells us about following Jesus. A lot of people say, Oh yeah, I'll follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to be inconvenienced now. You say, you want to follow me? Look, a fox has a hole and a bird has a nest and I don't have any place. You sure, you, and you say you want to follow me? Well, you know, I, I, I do, but I, I didn't really mean it that way. Or someone says, well, let me go first bury my father. Now, you would think that if the fellow's father had died and they're about to have the funeral and all, that Jesus could wait for it to bury his father. But, but you've made a lot of assumptions there. You don't know if his father was dead or not yet. He's just saying, I just want to wait and take care of my father first. And there's a lot of people that do this. They say, now, I'll follow Jesus I'm going to follow Jesus, but I, I want to take care of this first. Well, no, no. Let the dead bury the dead. Even if that father had died and was ready to be buried, if one thing that teaches us, to follow Jesus is more important even than our own family obligations. If we can't do both, we need to follow Jesus. Never a man spake like that man. And so he's teaching us something about what it means to follow him. And there's a lot of people say, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. But they want to follow Jesus on their terms. Jesus says, you follow me. You're doing it on my terms. Okay, let's go to the next little incident. Acts 8, 23 through 27. And when he was entering to the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, inasmuch as the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Now think about that. I mean, these ships weren't very big. And Jesus is in that ship, and this is a storm. And this isn't any little storm. This is a bad storm. And the waves are coming up and going over the boat. And Jesus is asleep. Well, you see, Jesus was God in the flesh, but he was in the flesh. And he was a man, and he was exhausted. He was so exhausted in that ship that he wasn't even awakened by this storm. Now, I, it's hard for me to imagine God being tired like that. We read in the Psalms, he never sleeps and he never slumbers. But Jesus, see, he became like us, and he did become weary and tired, and here he is asleep. Look how vulnerable he looks, asleep while the storm is raging. And then it says this, the disciples came unto him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Don't you remember those disciples? They were fishermen. They knew this sea. They knew this boat. They knew about storms. And yet this was something that was out of their control. They said, help us, we perish. Well, he woke up and he said unto them, Why are you fearful? O oh, ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man? See the humanity here? He's a man. He's asleep. A man. What manner of man 
is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him. Now, if Jesus said, like he said in other accounts, peace be still, and the wind stops blowing, and the sea becomes still, don't you imagine that storm turned into a night of stillness? I, it just in my mind, it doesn't go to this detail, but just imagine, wouldn't that sea of Galilee just be as smooth as glass and hardly a, a breeze? And the ship is coasting near the shore. And it comes to that other shore. They're coming over there where the cemetery is. There's a, there's a graveyard. And out of that graveyard, they hear this wild man hollering, hollering things out. Isn't that just a scary scene going on in the darkness of the still? You've seen the still after a storm. Well, imagine that. And so here's what happens. It's not just one of them. There are two of them. It says, and when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. Now, it doesn't say it here in Matthew, but it tells us there was a legion of devils. Now, that's between five and 6,000 devils. So it says there are two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce. And behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come here that to torment us before the time? I tell you, that is scary. If I was one of those apostles, I'd almost say, you know, I'd rather be back out there in that storm right now. Um, those demons knew who Jesus was, didn't they? See, the devils believe and tremble. And so they said, thou son of God, art thou come hither torment us before thou... And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. Now you got to take into consideration here. I don't have time to explain it all, but, but the Jews, they weren't really supposed to be around all these swine. And there was a whole herd of them out here feeding. And, and there were people out there watching the swine and they were witnessing everything here going on. Because watch what happens. It says, so the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. When they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine read violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled. See, there were those keepers. They saw this happen. And boy, when they saw that, I, they did what I think I would have do. I'd gotten out of there. When they saw that, they fled and went their ways into the city and told everything what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. This scared them in that city. They said, well, something has happened here. And they weren't comfortable with it. And here Jesus that can come and bless them in so many. And they just say, I, just leave, just leave. And they couldn't imagine what this was. And so Jesus left them. Let's go into chapter 9. He entered into a ship and passed over and came to his own city. That'd be Capernaum. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy. Here's another man sick of palsy. And he's lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing his faith, said to the sick of palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Well, and behold, certain of the scribes and Pharisees said within themselves, This man blasphemous. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know. See, that's why he's doing this. He wants them to know. He don't want them to just hear about it and think, wonder about it. I want you to know this that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. See, the other accounts say, no man can do this but God only. Well, they were right about that. So well, who does that make Jesus now? So the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of palsy, arise, take up thy bed and go to thy house. <laughs> 
And that man, it says this, and he arose. Well, he was so wet, he could carry his own bed. Now, that'd be the, the roll. I mean, he rolled it up, you know, and carry it out like that. It wasn't like a four-poster bed now, but he, he rolled his bed up, and he walked out carrying his own bed. The, the bed carried him in, and he carried the bed out. He arose and departed to his own house. And now the multitudes saw it. It wasn't just a few. The multitudes saw this. They marveled and glorified God, which had given such power to man. They knew about this. They, they knew this, this, this comes from God. And the evidence is there. Well, now we'll get to this next memory verse anyway. When Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew. Oh, I got to tell the next one. Okay, I'm going to tell this one and the next one because it kind of goes together. But here it is. He saw Matthew. Now, Matthew's a publican. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. See, he's a tax collector. They, they go to him, pay their taxes. So he was not the most popular man now around, the, the man that takes your taxes. You know, they're never real popular. So, so here's Matthew. We've got to pay him our taxes. He said, follow me. And he arose and followed him. This is that Matthew that writes this book. Interesting, isn't it? That Jesus took a man that would normally be despised and yet used this man to reach the heart of Israel. It wouldn't reach all of them. There were those, I'm sure, that were just prejudiced enough, so I'm not going to listen to a tax collector. And listen, they're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. It took those who were humble and willing to listen anyway and be convinced not by the man, but by the testimony which he gave. And so Matthew followed him. Now let me go to the next one because it has to do with publicans, okay? Here it is. And it came to pass, Jesus said at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto him, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Now here's one of those, one of those elliptical statements. It doesn't mean he wouldn't accept sacrifice. No, no, no. Don't, don't think that. I will have mercy also and not sacrifice only. That's what it means. But the also and only are left out for emphasis here. He says, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. For I'm not come to call the righteous only, but sinners also to repentance. See? That's how you fill out the... And by leaving that out, it really makes the point then, see? I've come to call sinners. That's why he's sitting with publicans and sinners. Okay, I'm a little over where I think I probably ought to stop. So the test is going to be through Matthew 9, 13. And you know what that means? I got all four memory verses in there. So you got all the memory verses <laughs> come Wednesday night, and then we'll go through Matthew 9, which 8 to 9, 13. And I'm going to have to just keep pushing, pushing, because we got a lot of ground to go before we get to the 11, before the uh, first Sunday in November. So we'll do that then. But I want to extend this invitation. These things are written that ye might believe. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ? You say, oh yes. Well, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And don't be like those folks that says, well, now, now wait a minute. I, I want to follow Jesus, but I want to do this first. No, no, that's not how it works. It's time to follow Jesus now and put everything else secondary. And if you're willing to do that tonight, then come forward and be baptized into Christ while we stand and sing.